Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in, in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the ch children of Israel, out of Egypt." But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right. Well, we are going uh, to continue our sermon series, Firm Foundation. Um, but before we do that, um, yeah, I just want to pray very briefly uh, that this can be to us the Word of God. God, we thank you for this Word that you are giving to us, Lord. I, I know sometimes we hear a story that's familiar to us, and we need to hear it in new ways. So God, may you speak to us. Uh, by your word and by the words of your servant, God. I know my words are not perfect, but you are. So take and use what has been prepared and use it, God, for uh, the blessing of your people today. And may we be able to receive it with glad hearts, uh, to, to receive it with honesty and openness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, friends, uh, last week our brother Young uh, talked about exile. And he talked about this idea that exile is a departure from the life that we perhaps want. Uh, and, and, you know, it's like kind of this not ideal state. Well, I think we can all relate to that, right? Right now, as we are going through this coronavirus time, you know, and maybe for a lot of us, we're wondering, how long? How long is this go, gonna go on? Do you remember in March when this all started? And I remember, um, my kids' school, uh, it closed for two weeks. And, um, you know, that was the thought, like, ah, you know, we'll just be gone for a couple weeks and then we'll come right back, right? And now here we are, what, by my calculations, more than eight months later, right? And, you know, in many ways, there seems to be no end in sight. How long? You know, maybe there's this question that, that you've been having. And, uh, you know, maybe... Like, it doesn't seem like a really proper question to ask, you know, in small group or in a church setting, but I'll ask it for you. Where is God? Where is God in a global pandemic? Where is God in the midst of all this stuff that we are going through? I think that's a question that the Israelites probably asked a lot when they were going through their time of exile, right? Um, 
as, as we talked about last week, uh, the exile of the Israelites to, the, to Babylon, it lasted 70 years. You know, I hope this coronavirus stuff doesn't last that long. You know, but how much longer? A year, two years? Uh, there, there's so many instances in the Bible of people kind of stuck in a place where they do not want to be. You know, the Israelites wandering in the desert for 40 years, right? Um, in the story today, uh, we're picking up on where we left off a couple weeks ago, where uh, the Israelites ended up going to Egypt and they moved there because there was a great famine. And because Joseph had come to favor in Egypt and he was able to help them out. But a couple generations had passed and the new Pharaoh had completely forgotten Joseph. And so now the people of Israel were treated like foreigners and they were uh, treated very badly and they were enslaved and they were forced to do hard labor. And probably the Israelites were wondering, how long? God, where are you? Where are you in our suffering? And in many ways, today's message, uh, today's passage that, that we looked at and we're going to go into in depth right now, talks about that. You know, because you're probably wondering, uh, if you were an Israelite, where is God? Now, the story picks up with Moses, who was an Israelite, but Moses grew up in Egypt. Uh, he grew up, uh, you know, very privileged, but he is in an exile of his own. He has moved out of Egypt. Uh, he is in the land of Midian, and uh, he uh, is tending the flocks of his father-in-law, Jethro. So let's pick it up here in verse 1. Uh, so Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. This is one of the instances where, you know, it's really hard for us to, to uh, uh, grasp this, 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 this picture. You know, there's a bush uh, as, as, you know, there, it would have been very dry and it wouldn't have been unusual for a bush to catch on fire. I mean, you think about the California wildfires and how dry it is and how easily uh, fires can start when brush is, is, is dry. Um, but the weird thing is he looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. It's not going away. It just keeps burning. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned. And I want you guys to, uh, to notice something here. It says, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Now, the question that I have is, what if Moses didn't turn aside? What if Moses was like, ah, this is a bush, bush that's burning. That's kind of weird, but, you know, that, that happens. I, I, I'm busy. I have things to do. You know, I, I got to take care of these sheep. We got to keep moving. We don't have time for this, you know? But the fact that Moses stops, something tells him, hey, this is unusual. There's something going on here. He doesn't really know what it is, but he's like, I'm going to go check this out, you know? And, and Moses pausing here to just linger in this moment makes all the difference in many ways, right? This is when God speaks to him. This is when Moses calls out, Mo, uh, God calls out to Moses, Moses, Moses. And Moses, to his credit, responds. He's not like, man, I'm just hearing things, you know? But he says, here I am. And then, uh, if we can go to the next slide. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Holy means set apart. Holy is a word that we use for God, right? It doesn't mean super sacred or, you know, uh, that sort of thing. What, what it actually means is set apart. It is different. It is categorically different. This place where you're at, it's not just ordinary ground. It is holy ground because the presence of God is here. And God says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And so uh, I, I put a, a picture here. Uh, it's just an artist depiction of what this scene might have looked at. And I've seen other artist depictions. I, I didn't put them up here, but, uh, you know, when I did a Google image search, some of them have Moses, like, in front of the burning bush, and he's, like, in reverent worship like this, you know? Maybe he's on his knees, but he's, like, looking straight at the bush that's on fire. 
And that, unfortunately, is not accurate. <laughs> this is a little bit more accurate. You know, uh, Moses is kind of like looking away, but he's still kind of trying to look. But what the Bible tells us is that Moses, upon hearing this, hearing that it's not just a weird bush, but hearing that it is God, the God of his, his, his ancestors, Moses hid his face. Why? Because he was afraid to look at God. Why was he afraid to look at God? This is a common theme in scripture. Whenever people are in the presence of God, they're not like drawn to it like a moth to the flame. They're not like, oh, this is cool. And they don't even look in reverent worship. They almost always close their eyes. They look away. They want to run away. Even if you remember when the the first disciples, when when before they know who Jesus is and, and Jesus helps them fishing and they have that massive catch of fish, you remember what Peter's response was, he was afraid. He said, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man, right? The tendency is to turn away from the holiness, right? Holiness means that God is set apart. He is different. How is he different? He is so holy, so pure, so good, that we as sinful people cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. There are stories of people in the Old Testament who accidentally touch, uh, we'll we'll talk about this in a few weeks, but the Ark of the Covenant that has the stone tablets of of the the covenant, symbolizing the covenant that God makes with Israel. And people accidentally touch this this, this chest, uh, this Ark of the Covenant, and they die. This is how holy God is. Now, brothers and sisters, isn't this so different than the way that we normally think about God, right? Now, I I just want to kind of like show my hand a little bit. You know, today's message is the God who is here, right? And we are going to talk about the nearness of God, you know? Um, I know that in many ways, holy means separate. God is not like us. But the amazing thing about our faith, the, uh, one, one of the good news that, that we, um, at, at least for me, that, that I really appreciate about our faith, is that God could be far away, but this holy God chooses to be with us. And that's such a comforting thought. And when we get to Jesus, Jesus seems so humble and gentle, and he's so forgiving. And in many ways, we get really cozy with that. Right? Like, we're like, oh, God, you're here. You know, and it's almost like, I don't know, maybe for some of you who are like quarantining with someone, with your family, do you ever just get like used to them? You don't even notice that they're, 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 they're there, you know? Maybe like you get up in the morning and you're walking around your house and you didn't even notice that your, 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 your mom or dad was sitting there in the corner. You know, maybe you just kind of look up, you're like, oh, oh, you're there. Do we ever treat God like that? Like, oh, oh yeah, God, I guess you're, guess you're here, you know? I mean... It just makes sense on an intellectual level that God is everywhere, right? So yeah, 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 no big deal. God is here. That never would have been the mentality of someone like Moses. He never would have been that casual with the presence of God, right? He wouldn't have even looked at God, right? The, the idea of the presence of God made him quake, made him turn away, made him despair, Oh, no, right? Oh, we don't have that kind of fear, right? We don't have that kind of reaction to God. And yet, in Scripture, we're told uh, in the book of Proverbs, for example, we're told about how important the fear of God is. It says in, in Proverbs, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. There's something really important about that, right? We're talking about firm foundations, and this is a foundation that we cannot remove. Yes, I know we are in the New Testament. I know we are talking about Jesus, right, who loves us and forgives us. But make no mistake, you cannot lose the fear of God. It's very important. Why? Why is it so important? I'm going to make this statement and try to convince you, but don't just take my word for it, but just take a moment to read this statement and just, you know, what do you think? What do you think about it? Um, You will fear God 
or you will fear the things of this world. You will fear God, or you will fear, fear the things of this world. Do you think that's true? Now, I think a lot of us fear the things of this world. We fear coronavirus. We fear an economic depression if this continues, right? We fear the future and whether or not we are going to get the job that we want or a job that's going to be able to provide for our family, right? We fear other people. We fear uh, fanatics on the, the other political side and, and we fear what they might do if they don't get their way. There's so many things that we're afraid of, right? We're afraid of sickness. We're afraid of cancer. And brothers and sisters, in many ways, those things, I mean, let's be honest, they have some power. They can do things to us. They can harm us, potentially. That's why we're afraid of them, right? And, you know, maybe for us, we say, okay, but Pastor Steve, when you say fear, I mean, are you talking about like quaking fear? I mean, I know that's what Moses had. But it, today's message is in many ways is a paradox. It, it's, it's kind of this contradiction in a way. You have a God that we should fear, a holy God who is near and who is with us. We have to be able to hold both sides of that paradox, right? God is a holy God who is not like us, who is so holy and good that in many ways, um, you know, a sinful person cannot stand in the holiness of God, and yet God wants to be near us. And yes, I know in Scripture, you know, it says that um, perfect love casts out fear, right? And, and maybe in some ways this is the one fear that is exempt, the fear of God. This is the first fear. <laughs> you know, all the other fears should go, go away, you know? But what a lot of us do um, when we look at the word fear, and, and this is actually normally the way I teach it too, is we're like, okay, okay, I know we say fear God, but we're not talking about like, ah, you know, that kind of fear. We're talking about respect, you know, respecting God. Now, I, I want to use the example of, uh, can you imagine there's like a zookeeper who is like around lions all the time? Here, I'm going to show you a picture of a lion. So uh, can you imagine that, you know, a lion is this fierce, you know, king of the beasts, right? A lion could easily just, bah, end your life, right? It could eat you, you know? For many of us, we would naturally be afraid of the lion. And, and if you're a zookeeper and you're around this lion, you know, maybe the first time you're around this lion, you're like, oh my gosh, like this lion is so fierce looking and it gets a little too close to the bars of the, the, the cage and you're like, oh, you know, you flinch every time. Every time you, you go to feed it in the beginning, those first couple weeks, you're like, ah, here's your food, here's your food. But after a while, after being with this lion for a while, you're, you're, you're not like, you know, trembling afraid. You can get really close to that cage. You know, yeah, you're, you're even like, you know, you're like glad to see the lion. And you're like, hey, lion, you give it a name. You're like, hey, George, you know. But this is the thing. I think that zookeeper would never lose that healthy respect for what a lion can do. I think the zookeeper, even though he can be close to the lion now, will never forget what a lion is, Right? You would never just go into the lion and be like, hey, whatever, like kick it, you know, mess with it, you know, scruff its hair, you know. You're going to remember it's a lion. It makes me think of um, in C.S. Lewis's uh, Chronicles of Narnia, um, God is represented by Aslan, who is a great lion. And uh, there, there's uh, this exchange where um, there's these children who go into Narnia and they hear about this great lion, Aslan. And so one of the characters, Mr. Beaver, is telling Susan about Aslan. And so um, Mr. Beaver says, uh, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Ooh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel, I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. It is British, so I'm trying to... That's my terrible British accent, but 
Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Man, that line just stays with me, you know? Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he's not safe. He's a lion. But he's good. He is so good. Because he's the king. I think that's true of our God. You know, God isn't safe. You know, not in the way that, um, you know, he's not like a completely detoothed lion. And in many ways, we're going to talk about this as we continue in this passage. I don't think you want God to be a detoothed lion. I think you want God to be powerful. I do, at least. But at the same time, God is good, right? But never forget who God is. He is holy. And we have to keep that in our minds, right? I, I think, you know, it is one of the great problems of Christianity and religion today. And for any of us, we, we just think of God so casually, right? And we're just like, yeah, you know, if I do this or don't do this, or, you know, if I believe this or don't believe that, you know, God will forgive me, you know? And brothers and sisters, I'm not saying that God won't. But I think in all of this, we forget who God really is. And sometimes we talk about God and we treat God as if God were like us. And maybe in some ways we actually treat God, maybe we don't want to admit this, but we treat God as if God is less than us. We get to decide what we believe. We get to decide what we do or what we don't do. We look at scripture and we're like, I like that, mm, I don't like that. God, you said that, but mm, did you really say that? Will God really hold me to that? Mm, I'm not sure. Brothers and sisters, I wonder if we have forgotten, we have forgotten the fear of God. Now, Moses didn't. Uh, and and when, when you see this, um, you, you, I, I'm gonna, you're going to be reminded why we don't want a detoothed lion. Because what, what God says is, he says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, remember, we're holding two things in tension. The fact that God is with us, right, and with us in every sense. God understands us. We know that. It's one of the things we love about Jesus, that God became a man, and he knows what we're going through. Right? Isn't that so good? Isn't that so comforting? Do you ever go through a hard time? And sometimes, you know, somebody is with you by your side. You know, and, and they may not be doing anything to change the circumstance. You know, maybe you lost your job or something, or something's breaking your heart, you know, something out there in the world. And there's somebody who's comforting you. You know, maybe they're like rubbing your back, or they're just by your side. I don't know, you're properly socially distancing, but they're just like, Hey, man, I'm here for you. You know, maybe they don't even need to say anything. But you just feel comforted knowing that someone is there with you. That's so good. But brothers and sisters, is that all Christianity is? Is it just there's a God who's with us, but God's like, well, I'm not going to do anything about it. You know, well, maybe for some of us, we're like, okay, God used to move like that. God used to intervene and, and be a warrior God and free the people. But now, he seems like a detoothed lion. Yeah, he's like a, a presence, a spirit, you know? Maybe it's just, just the sense that, you know, God is with you, you know? Like, like God is just comforting you, like, oh, yeah, I'm here. And by the way, brothers and sisters, I'm saying that aspect of Christianity is very good. But I'm also questioning, is that all there is? In this passage, that is not all there is. God doesn't just say, I heard your suffering. He says, I'm going to do something about it. 
I'm going to enter into your suffering, and I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to save you. We don't just talk about Jesus as a presence, God as a presence. We talk about Jesus as a Savior, as somebody who can deliver, right? What does that mean? That means that many of us are in bondage, right? I mean, I think we can be in bondage in many ways, in ways that I think we know does not reflect the will of God. It is not good for us to be in bondage. And I think God believes that too. Do you believe, though, that when you are going through those hard times, it's not just that God understands you, but he can actually do something about it. And actually, to take it even further, God doesn't just say, I'm going to do something about it, but he's going to send his people. He's going to send Moses. He's going to send his brother Aaron. He's going to send people as his his ambassadors. And he's telling him, I want you to go on my behalf. I want you to go and tell these people that I'm with them, right? It does involve us. Sometimes that's also what Christianity becomes. We're like, okay, God's somewhere there in heaven. God used to act on our behalf, but now it's just all us. We're the hands and feet of Jesus. Now we're the ones who have to do all the work, right? And sometimes Christianity can become super humanistic like that, right? Um, I'm not saying this is a bad thing to be about social justice and being about humanitarian stuff. I think there's a long, long tradition of the church doing just that, right? Of caring for people, caring for the poor, caring for the sick, right? There's so many hospitals. How many hospitals are are Christian hospitals or, you know, they they were founded by churches, you know, or founded by Christians, you know, Uh, St. Jude, all this kind of stuff, right? And so, yes, we are supposed to be the hands and feet. We are supposed to be instruments of salvation. But make no mistake, when when God sends Moses, he says, yeah, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children out of Israel, out of Egypt. But remember what he says to Moses. I am with you, not just as a presence to comfort you. I am with you as the Savior. I'm the one who's going to give you the power. I am not a detooth lion. And Moses, by the way, <laughs> is afraid. Moses actually uh, tries to wriggle out of it. You know, he keeps saying, no, 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 God, send someone else. Send someone else. You know, I'm not eloquent. I can't speak well. He tries to use all these excuses, but ultimately Moses goes. Why? I mean, why did he try to wriggle out of it? Because he was afraid. Of course he'd be afraid, right? Uh, it, Moses at this time is a fugitive. Um, he, he killed an Egyptian guard that he saw uh, abusing um, a, a, an Israelite, and um, people saw him. And so Moses was a criminal. You know, they were seeking him uh, to arrest him, And so Moses is like, dude, why would I go back to Egypt? You know, I'm a wanted man, right? And and for me to go in front of Pharaoh, right, who at this time arguably could be the most powerful man in the world, right, the most powerful man in the world, and to go before him and be like, you know what? You know this this free labor force you have, all these slaves you have, and that, that have made your nation great? and and have have given you a lot of economic prosperity. Yeah, I want you to free them all. Yeah, oh, you you remember me? (laughs) I'm the guy who killed that that, that guard, you remember? Yeah, I want you to set the the slaves go. Moses is thinking, this is crazy. He's afraid. But Moses goes. Moses goes. Why? Because he's more afraid of God. He has more fear of the Lord than he does of Pharaoh. And so he goes. And brothers and sisters, I want you to note what happens here. Maybe this is Moses trying to weasel out of it, but he's also like, you know, like, like I mean, yeah, he's a human being. Like, this really happened. He's like trying to figure out. He's like, okay, you're just telling me to go, right? But what assurances do I have? You know, who are you? How, how, how will I even be able to prove that I spoke to God? Right? And so Moses uh, says to God, uh, verse 11, 
Next slide. It says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, but I will be with you. There it is again. I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. This, brothers and sisters, is the holy name of God. Um, This is a name that is so respected and revered by the people of Israel. So much so that actually um, we're not even sure how to pronounce it. Because the, the people of Israel, whenever they would read scripture, they would look at the holy name of God. And it was four letters, four um, consonants. Y-H-W-H. Well, of course, it's not Y-H-W-H. It's the Hebrew letters that correspond to Y-H-W-H. It's yohe vat And And uh, uh, yohe vat uh, we're not sure how to pronounce it because in Hebrew, uh, it, it was all consonants. So if you look at the Hebrew Bible, it's just a bunch of consonants, and the vowels are implied. And so what would happen is that you would fill in the vowels, Right? And most, most of the time, people would look at it, and they would you know, the, know the context, and they would be able to fill in the vowels. Uh, but in this case, the people respected and revered and feared the name of the Lord so much that they wouldn't even say it out loud. And so whenever Yohe Varhe would come up, instead of saying that, they would say, Lord. Right? And, and so they would say a Hebrew word for Lord, like Adonai or Elohim, Lord Most High. And so in your Bibles, there's still a reflection of that. The holy name of God is all over your Bibles. It's whenever you see the word Lord, and it's in all capitals. Just look, in in the, the Old Testament, it's all over the place. Lord in all capitals does not say Lord. It says, Yohevat He. And, and actually, there are even modern uh, uh, Jewish people, sometimes they won't even write the word God. They'll write G-D, you know, and they won't say it out loud because of the respect that they have for the name of God, right? And, and you see that here in the next part uh, that it, it says, um, God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. They took this seriously. They're like, this name is so holy. It is so precious, right? Uh, What is this name? Uh, By the way, uh, brothers and sisters, if you want to know how to pronounce it, we're not even sure. You know, one approximation, according to some scholars, they think it's a pretty good guess, but one of the guesses is Yahweh, right? Uh, another guess, which we're pretty sure is wrong, because we think they just took the, the vowels from uh, Adonai or Elohim, and they just used that for the consonants, and so they made Yahweh, right? Or the, the Y is kind of like Yo. It's like a, a mixture between Y and a J. And the W is kind of a, a V. It's a, a mixture between a V and a W. And so... For some people, they made up this word, Jehovah, right? For the holy name of God, right? So you've heard it before, but what it means is I am that I am. That's what it means. The very name of God, brothers and sisters, it points to one essential fact about God, that God is. God is. He just is. He's not created. There was never a time before where there was no God. God eternally is. And he's not, you know, I was that I was, or I will be that I will be. You know, that can be true. God endures, but he is the I am. I am that I am that I am that I am. God persists. God is eternally present. 
A thousand years from now, a million years from now, a billion years from now, I will not be. None of you will be either. The earth won't be here, likely. <laughs> but God will be. Well, at least not in the current form, you know. We don't really know. We don't know what's going to happen. But I can tell you this. I am, will be here. He's the only being who can say that. He's uncreated. He is holy unto himself. And he is eternally present. It's amazing. And brothers and sisters, you, you know, God, by the way, you know, tells Moses, hey, you know, I'm not just some fire, <laughs> you know. I'm not just a spirit. I'm not just an angel, right? I, I, I'm not just a novelty. Where you are standing right now is holy ground. It is set apart. And in many ways, Moses is right to turn his face away. And yet, God's very name just points to the fact that God is everywhere. He is eternally present with us. And brothers and sisters, that name, by the way, you know, I, 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 sometimes when I teach this and, and people are kind of blown away, they're like, whoa, oh my gosh, the holy name of God, it's so sacred. And it's throughout scripture all the time. Why don't we, uh, uh, sometimes people will ask me, why don't we have that same name? Um, you know, why don't we say Yohei Vahe more? Why, why, why don't we, you know, talk about that more? Why don't you see that more like in the New Testament or have, hear more people talk about this? And there is a reason for this. We have a holy name. I want to show you what it is. And so, um, actually, uh, uh, Young went over a part of this passage last week. Uh, if we can go to Philippians. This is uh, Philippians uh, chapter 2. And we think that this is actually... Um, uh, we, we actually think that this is a hymn. Um, and so in this hymn, we're told that though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. So in other words, Jesus is equal to God, but he didn't take advantage of that. He didn't exploit that. He didn't use that, you know, uh, uh, to, to make people do anything, right? To, to, to use that with, you know, for power over people. It says, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the reason why we talk about Jesus being so humble, right? And, and it's easy for us to take advantage of that. Oh, God's so humble. Yeah, he'll forgive us. You know, he's so gentle. You know, he's got the lambs and all that stuff, you know. And, and we're told he really is God, but he emptied himself. He humbled himself. He became a servant. But we're told that because Jesus did that, it says, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Paul, as you know, is a Jewish person. When Paul says the name that is above every name, what name do you think he means? There can be only one name. For the people of Israel, there was only one name. Why doesn't Paul write it out? Because he's Jewish. You don't write out the holy name of God. But he makes it very clear what name he means. There can be only one. Yo he vat he, I am that I am, right? This is extraordinary. Brothers and sisters, seriously, just think about this for a moment. Jesus is given the status of the holy name of God. I am that I am. It says, so that at the name of Jesus, now at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is not a mistake, brothers and sisters. What is the Hebrew word that people would say instead of Yohei Vare? They would say Lord, right? Jesus is now given that name in a way. He is given the holy name of God. 
that now at Jesus' name, we respect, we bow, we worship, right? To the glory of God the Father. It's amazing. And if you think this is the only instance of this, oh, it, it is not. Take a look at John chapter 8. This is a story that doesn't make sense unless you know all the stuff we just talked about, about the holy name of God. So he's having this argument with the Jewish people about uh, whose children they are. And he's saying, you're not really the children of God because you're not listening to God's voice. And so the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And ha have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. I think you understand now why the people were trying to kill him when he said this. Because Jesus says, before Abraham, I am. They know what Jesus is doing. They know what Jesus is claiming. Jesus is not just a humble teacher. He's not just a good moral guy. Jesus is claiming to be the Son of God. He's claiming, as incredible as it sounds, to be the great I am. Now, what do we know about Jesus? Jesus was humble. Jesus did enter into all the stuff that we were going through, all the suffering, all the pain. Jesus was betrayed. Jesus was hurt and pierced and spat upon. He didn't have to go through any of that. He's the great I am. But he did that to be near us, to enter into life with us. Brothers and sisters, I, I, I have to confess, it's not just the presence of God that we take for granted. I think we take Jesus for granted. We take the cross for granted. We're like, yeah, 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 Jesus died for my sins. Okay, okay. But brothers and sisters, when you look at it, when you really just take a moment to understand what the Bible is claiming, I mean, it's mind-blowing. It's incredible that this holy God doesn't need any sickness or disease or any kind of lack to touch him. He gave it all up to be with us. And not just to be with us, to take our sin, to take our weaknesses upon him. And he was the sacrificial lamb that was slain so that we could live with him, so we could also be with God. You know, I, I think about this, and, and it makes me think of, uh, there's an old hymn, uh, that I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard before. Let's go to the next slide here. Um, it's called uh, um, uh, How Great Thou Art. And it says, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. You know, I mean, one of the things that I think um, we can do to try to remember that God is not just some disembodied spirit, just, you know, automatically has to forgive us, but he is the great I am. Take a look. You know, be like Moses. You know, when you see something, it catches your eye. Don't just go on your business. Take a moment to, you know, right now, um, actually, the wind is blowing quite hard. I don't know if you guys remember at church, we have these kind of frosted uh, windows, and so you can't see perfectly. But I can see out of this frosted window just the, the, the tree like going like this, back and forth, the wind. I mean, you know what the wind can do to a tree, to this building? 
right? You know what rain can do? It can erode the whole earth. We, we know that at one point there was a great flood that flooded all of the earth. God is awesome in his power. And maybe sometimes you'll hear the thunder, you know? And, and I know sometimes we're afraid, ah, thunder, you know? But uh, maybe just take a moment just to, to soak in. You know, when, when you're looking around, you're looking at these huge trees, you know? When, when, when you feel the air, when you see the snow falling, to just take a moment to wonder at the splendor, the glory of God. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And then there's, there's the next line here. It says, and when... I think of God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin, the great I am. Bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. James, can you go to the slide that's two up from here? Brothers and sisters, I just want us to take a moment to just soak in this knowledge and this truth. The statement that I put up here the God of the whole universe, the holy God, the great I am is here, is with you right now. There may be times where you experience God in uh, a burning bush. I think some of us have burning bush moments. Maybe you've been at a retreat or in a time of prayer, um, you know, your emotions swell or you have some kind of spiritual experience you know, I've had times like that, for sure. But then there are other times that are kind of more like Elijah. You guys remember Elijah? Elijah was fleeing from Ahab and Jezebel, this evil king and queen. Um, and uh, he, he went to the mountain to flee from them. And uh, Elijah is just really tired. And he's really worn out. And there has been this great famine in the land. There's been a great drought. And, and again, this is another person who is maybe wondering, how long, O oh Lord? How long will I be pursued by my enemies? How long will this drought continue? And God tells him to go out to the face of the mountain to encounter the presence of God. And when he's there, we're told uh, that there's a couple things that happen when, when he's out there. Um, it says that, there was a great and strong wind that tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the winds. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. Sometimes this gets translated as a still, small voice. Uh, I, I think in the ESV, it says something like, in, in the notes, something like a low silence, right? Barely audible, barely audible. Brothers and sisters, God is with us. And sometimes you'll notice it in the thunder. And sometimes you'll notice it on just an ordinary day. It's just kind of like partly cloudy, you know. Leaves have fallen. Nothing really too beautiful to look at. But maybe if you just take a moment to just be still. Maybe, just maybe. You'll be able to sense and know that you are not alone. Moses went and took on Pharaoh, the greatest power on the earth, because he knew God was with him. I want to ask the priest to come up. Brothers and sisters, coronavirus is real. 
The times we are going through are real and they are trying. But I say this with confidence. I say this with the faith that we have been given throughout thousands of years of the church, of the people of God. Coronavirus ain't got nothing on the great I am. Amen? This is the God we worship. We don't know how long it's going to take. We don't know in what way God will deliver us. We don't know how long these things will last. It's not for me to decide, right? And that's one of the things that, that the people of Israel understood. You know, Yes, you can go before God, and God will hear your prayers, and God will hear your cries and, and your laments. and you know, that, that can be a good and healthy thing to do. But sometimes, brothers and sisters, at the end of that, we just need to stand in wonder, in silence, and in faith and in trust, and say, God, no matter what happens, if the earth quakes, if the, the pandemic continues, if the cases go up or if they don't go up, the economy recovers or doesn't recover, you are here. You are here. So I don't need to quake. I can stand here in faith. If you send me out to Pharaoh, I can go. I can endure because you are with me. This is the God we worship. Jesus went to the cross. Now, our crosses are nothing compared to his, but we're told to take them up, and we can, brothers and sisters, because God is with us. We're going to go into this song in a moment, but let's just take a moment to just rest in this knowledge. Again, the great I am is here with us. Let's just soak in that. Let's just appreciate that. The great I am is here with us.